Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I just want to welcome you to the PATH FinTech Women in Compliance um, event today. We are honoured to have a panel that includes Susan Luby from TU Dublin, Jill O'Brien from Delight, Michelle, Michelle McGuire, oh my God, Michelle, you're going to hate me, from Validate, uh -huh. and of course, the one and only moderator, and who was afraid he'd be the only man in the room, Mr. Uh -huh. Andrew Quinn. Um, delighted to say that he's not. Um, and hopefully you find something, you get something out of today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me after the event. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jackie. And actually, um, thanks, Jackie, for organising this. Uh, it was very much Jackie's idea to put this together. Um, it's the first webinar we've actually done as PAT Business School. So thank you for uh, being here today. It's a really, it's a really good event to start off with. And hopefully they're going to become a more frequent occurrence, right, Jackie? We're planning um, on making it a more frequent thing. So, look, first of all, I just want to say thank you to, um, if you like, the panellists, and thank you to everyone else that's in the room, and thank you to Ran for showing up and saving me being the only man in the room. Thank you, Ran. Um, so what I might do just to begin with is just ask, and I'll just go in the order that we are on the screen, starting with Susan, um, just a little bit about yourself, Susan, and your current role and kind of, how you got to where you are today from wherever you started type thing. Yeah, uh, and thank you, Andrew and Pat Business School. I'm delighted to be here on International Business Day. I was just saying at the start, I'm missing a mother's lunch in my son's school today to be here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I am delighted to, 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 I am actually delighted to join you. And um, uh, I'm actually a lecturer in this, in the Faculty of Business School of Accounting, Economics um, and Finance with TU Dublin. Um, I lecture mainly in accounting and finance, but also in entrepreneurship, um, business startups and project management. Uh, and I'm currently also lecturing on that higher diploma in regularity, risk and compliance, which I'm delighted to be involved with the collaboration with Pat Business School and TU Dublin. So I bring, I bring the benefit of over 20 years uh, experience in industry to my students. But where did I start? <laughs> I'll make it brief because I believe I'm probably the oldest of our very distinguished panel this afternoon. Um, I basically graduated from University UCG, the University of Galway now, uh, and in the late 90s, um, late 80s, uh, early 90s, Ireland was, of course, a very different space. So I made the decision to emigrate to um, to London. Um, and at that time, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, London, London was a very happening place. I, I, I just started looking in the square mile of London. So I ended up uh, in, in various jobs, but I ended up working for a Japanese reinsurance company. Um, and I started there as, as a financial accountant. I studied ACCA, so I'm delighted to say I'm, because I know you support ACCA students. Uh, I chose that particular uh, qualification because it gave me that flexibility of working in industry. At the time, I just didn't want to go into, uh, we'll say an accountancy firm, uh, and I wanted to go straight into industry. So using that qualification, um, I, I then progressed to a finance manager, and I became a company secretary at that point um, uh, for the Japanese company. And it was great because I got a, not only a trip to Tokyo out of it, <laughs> because I was a company secretary, but because it gave me that that uh, introduction to boards at the time, it was hugely interesting, uh, and it was a great way to learn about the business, the reinsurance business at the time. So I, I ended up uh, leaving uh, London and coming back to Dublin then in the late 90s. Ireland then, of course, was beginning to take off. The Celtic Tiger was coming. It was a very happening place. I saw an advertisement in the Irish Times. Very interesting job working with funds, equities, um, private equity, and they also had a property and art portfolio, etc. So I ended up um, saying that looks really interesting. It was a family office, a very wealthy family. They had international business, and I spent spent nineteen years there. Wow. Uh, yeah, I know because it was just yeah. hugely interesting. It, it 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 introduced you to not only the hedge fund space and equities portfolios, but also they they had property and art and uh, antiques and they and the charitable giving side of it I liked as well. So it was a hugely interesting job, ever changing, international. We had a revenue ruling that, uh, to protect the business. We paid tax in Ireland, but anything outside of Ireland, a bit like the IFC companies, um, we we didn't pay tax outside of Ireland. Uh, so um, so I was would have been involved with boards as well. I was on a board 
So I was I was involved at boards all my career, basically. So when I finished up with them, because they moved back onto to to uh, the US, I ended up um, at a junction. OK, that was in 2018. <laughs> and I thought, God, there aren't that many other jobs like this out there. There are more now. There are more family offices setting up in Dublin. Um, but there weren't then. And I decided I'd go and do Institute of Directors training. I would said I'd take it, my first career break ever. And I do some institute, institute of directors training, and um, that was phenomenal. Like it introduced me, to, I'm still in touch with that cohort, fifty two, uh, great senior people, very very interesting. Uh, and I started working on boards then, uh, and I started lecturing. So I did some part time lecturing, and since twenty eighteen, I'm now a permanent um, member of staff with TU Dublin. Delighted to be there. They they encourage research. I'm doing a research um, um, study at the moment. Uh, into this whole area of uh, diversity inclusion. Uh, so um, again, it's studying uh, how effective uh, uh, and how responsive industry is in financial services sector to affirmative actions, uh, positive actions to promote gender gender balance in senior executive positions and on boards. So I'm giving back through that and through my students uh, and through being on charitable boards at the moment. So that's where I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, and actually, I, I was hoping to get a chance to talk to you a little bit about your research hopefully later on um, and yeah. i'll keep moving Gillian, do you want to similar tell us a little bit about the path to where you are today yeah absolutely uh, i don't think i have anything as interesting as Susan. <laughs> that's um that's pretty incredible but um so at the moment i'm a senior manager in the regulatory and legal support team in deloitte um i suppose i uh did a degree in UL in risk and insurance. Um, and then I started my career actually originally in captive insurance. And I happened to be in the insurance space um, in 2016, right around the implementation of Solvency 2. So I think um, for me, that's kind of what piqued my interest in the, the world of compliance. And I suppose got, re got me involved in that kind of regulatory implementation, regulatory change space. Um, and then I moved to Deloitte in 2018 and I've been with the firm then I originally joined as a senior consultant so I've kind of progressed progressed in the firm uh, my role at the moment is incredibly varied um, I support a lot of our insurance clients still and kind of um, I suppose that's the space where I, sometimes I feel most comfortable but I uh, do end up working across all areas of the financial services sector um, predominantly on areas of regulatory change um, looking at kind of compliance function effectiveness and then um, a little bit about actually uh, to Susan's point about boards and governance, et cetera. So that's kind of a, an area of interest for myself as well. So just a, a little bit about me. Um, and as I said, you have been in the firm uh, five and a half years. Right. Thanks, Gillian. And then just to finish up, uh, certainly last but not least, uh, Michelle. Two tough acts to follow. Um, <laughs> I'm Michelle McGuire, for those of you who don't know me. Um, my compliance career certainly hasn't been linear um, and I don't think any career is really truly linear. Um, I am a law graduate. I did my solicitor exams and very quickly found that I hated it. Um, and, you know, it wasn't the life for me. Um, I'm very much a beginning, middle and end sort of person. I like to complete tasks and I found the pace of, of legal work just a bit too slow for my liking. Um, and uh, with that in mind, I decided I would take a job in a legal department of a bank. So that sort of seems a bit of a strange move, but it led me uh, towards risk and compliance ultimately. So I was in the legal department of ACC Bank, which is now defunct. Um, I, and I spent a couple of years there pre-08. So I'm showing my age a little bit right now, but uh, pre-08. So all in, in the midst of the Celtic di Tiger uh, madness. Um, and just before really everything came crashing down, I went into hedge funds um, and I moved towards anti-money anti laundering and KYC. And I spent a couple of years doing that with Vices, which became Citibank. Um, and I decided, right, OK, I'm time for a change. And Morgan Stanley had just opened in Dublin. This was uh, 2000 and 10 towards 2011 and they were looking for somebody to look at their AML, their risk, their compliance and uh, I took a job with them and I spent almost 10 years doing that 
Um, and it was a very, very job. I really loved it. Um, and, you know, learned lots about Cayman, Hong Kong, uh, Bermuda, the US. Um, and a bit like Susan and Gillian, I worked a lot with boards as well, boards of our hedge funds, uh, board, boards of the company as well. So really, really interested in that. And I decided I just couldn't take the M1 motorway any longer and um, needed a break, needed not to commute for a while. This is before COVID, so I, I didn't have that forcible break. Um, and I, I was offered a role in a, a reg tech here in Dundalk where I live. Very big leap of faith for me, um, very much out of my comfort zone. And if I'm being very honest, I took it because of proximity to home. Um, so I was thrown into the world of technology um, with a compliance lens and safe to say, I absolutely love the space. Um, and I, a couple of years ago, I was pregnant with my son and I decided I would take some time for my new family. And um, of course, being the person I am, I had spotted this post that Validate Me had put up very late at night, um, looking for people who were interested to talk to them about roles they had. And I'd been tracking Validate Me, the fintech scene in, in Ireland is quite small. We all seem to know each other. And um, I'd been following this company because I thought what they were doing was very, very interesting. And uh, I answered the the meeting while I feed. And um, a year and a half later, here I am as their head of risk and compliance. And um, I guess the beauty about my job is it's very varied. No two days are the same. Um, and that's what makes compliance interesting. Um, it, you know, your role can vary. You can twist and turn and you can change along along the path as you go um, and uh, when I do have some spare time um, <laughs> I'm a member of the PAT faculty and um, so full disclosure um, I'm a member of the faculty and I lecture on the HDIP in uh, regulatory risk or regulatory risk and compliance or fintech risk and compliance rather sorry and um, I do a bit of moonlighting on the door of course as well um, when, I, when I really have extra time to spare so um, that my continual education led me to that because I'm a believer in lifelong learning and probably a little bit too vocal for my own good. And Andrew <laughs> to come, and, come and, and teach his classes. So that's that's where we are today. Let's say I just I, I noticed Michelle very early on when she was actually a student with us. And I said to myself almost immediately, when we finish this course, I'm going to ask Michelle if she's interested in actually joining the faculty. And. That was about two and a half years ago and so on and so forth. I might just start with you then, Michelle, and just go back around with like the three ladies. And this is actually a question I, I as a man, I'm almost a little bit uncomfortable asking. Um, but an obvious question would be, um, what sort of challenges have, have you faced or observed as a woman carving out? And again, I must compliment Jackie, the three of you. The diversity and holistic nature of your three experiences covers an awful lot of territory. But just, you know, again, from from for, for um from your perspective, Michelle, what would you highlight as challenges you've either personally faced or you've observed in the workplace as a woman, if you like? Yeah, that's probably a tough question to answer with yeah. it being controversial. Um look, I worked in finance for a long time. So um this pre away was when I went into finance. Um, I certainly wasn't senior in my role at that point, but um, it was very male dominated, uh, very male centric, um, you know, sort of in some sense job for the lads sort of culture. And that can be very hard to navigate as a woman. Yeah. Um, women by, by very natures are empathetic. We're a bit more sensitive. Um, you know, we approach things a lot more holistically. And perhaps in those early days of my career, there was much, you know, a lot of a kind of fire and brimstone sort of environment, you know, where it was okay to shout at people and it was okay to expect people to do very long hours and um, grin and bear it. And look, it made me the kind of person I am today. I'm not saying it's right. I'm certainly not saying it's right. Um, but it was part of the culture at the time. And that can be very difficult for any woman to navigate. Um, I, at the time, was quite young and um, had I been slightly older and maybe at a different place in my life, it would have been very difficult to navigate perhaps work-life balance and, and family yeah. with an environment like that. Um, it goes without saying, I, I know for absolute fact, I probably 
or I was paid less than my male colleagues um, at various occasions. And I think that does speak to the fact that perhaps women are not as good a negotiators in some in some cases as men are. And, you know, I certainly find that conversation really, really awkward. The more mature I got, the more experience I got. I don't I don't find that so awkward anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much more upfront about my needs and wants now. But, it, you know, those things were difficult as a young woman starting out um, in a very, very male dominated. I think all my bosses, actually all my bosses throughout my career, have been male with the exception of one um so it's you know there wasn't a lot of female leadership um in in my growth in my career so the, you know there are challenges that I would have faced what I will say in balance is that the world has shifted um I think there's a lot more flexibility and accommodation there's a lot more senior women um you know that I encounter on a very regular basis and who are willing to share their experiences and that didn't exist uh you know 10 years ago very and I, I very confidently say that 10 years ago those those sort of senior female leadership networks did not exist yeah. um you know there may not have been an appetite for them but now I'm a mother now so um balance to me is very very important and there was no balance 10 10 plus years ago and it was very difficult for women of that age at that time and I saw it firsthand trying to juggle childcare issues or, uh, you know, just maternity leaves. One organization I worked in, the first female to go on maternity had no maternity policy. And they had to like, scrap a very big organization and they had to scramble to put a maternity policy together for, for this person. And it, it was quite shocking to me at the time. We're light years ahead now. Um, exactly. But they, I guess they were some of the things I saw and probably encountered um, in in my early days. I, I do feel the world has shifted um, forcibly and through legislation, but I think culturally as well. Yeah, I, I, I think we'll hopefully we'll, we'll get a chance to talk about that because Jackie actually sourced a nice piece of research from the central bank, which sort of quantifies what you said about women in leadership. And there's been a significant improvement over the last decade or so. But just real quickly, I want to segue to Gillian. Um, Look, I, my background too is financial services. And actually, Susan, I didn't realise our backgrounds are quite similar, actually, because I too went to London. I too worked for a hedge fund for a long time, stuff like that. And I, I one of the reasons I'm not working in financial services that I was lucky to shift into education is because I think as an individual, I did find it very abrasive as a man. It's a very, I found it a very abrasive industry. So going back um, 10, 15 years ago was when I probably left the industry, so to speak because I was uncomfortable with, with a lot of the attitude and the culture. And again, what you said there, and I'll lead it into you, Gillian, that, that change of culture comes from leadership, which means that obviously we need females, because I agree with you about the empathy and the, the, you know, the differences in the way women approach things to men, particularly in financial services. But Gillian, um, yourself, your own, if you like, challenges you may have faced or observed. Yeah, um, and like I think a lot of what Michelle said there would would re resonate with lots of people. Um, and I think uh, definitely, you know, you can kind of look back at your younger self sometimes in the situations you found yourself in and kind of go, oh, goodness me, uh, I don't think I'd I, I don't think I'd do that again now or maybe I wouldn't tolerate it or, you know, uh, things have definitely moved on. I think uh, I would say I've probably been lucky enough to work in progressive enough companies or worked in companies where there was that kind of, uh, there might've only been one of them, but there was that kind of woman in, in, in the distance you could kind of see forging her way. Um, so uh, I've kind of always been looking in terms of having an example or having somebody that you could say, right, okay, how are they navigating that path? I think what's probably been challenging for me, and uh, I'd be interested to see if uh, maybe Susan or Michelle think it as well, I think, um, definitely uh that piece about kind of like knowing your worth in terms of having the confidence to speak up I think maybe the challenges I faced haven't been as you know uh so much external but those internal challenges of kind of you know putting your foot down or um uh probably uh you know being uh confident in what you're doing what you're delivering I think sometimes uh women are very happy to kind of like do the work in the background I know that's a bit of a generalization but without kind of being 
super vocal, super transparent um, and super forthright, I think, in kind of the value we add. Um, I, that's something I've kind of struggled with myself. Um, and I think uh, something I like continue need to continuously work on. I think um, I think sometimes men have a tendency to shout louder about less. Um, uh, oh, damn, not to not to generalize, but uh, no, no. um, uh, so I think that's something like in terms of my own challenges, I need to get better at. And then in terms of what Michelle said as well, uh, I have a three year old toddler. Uh, I'm actually uh going on maternity leave at the end of May for the second time. Congratulations! So, uh, thank you. So I think as well, it's also navigating that whole aspect of like being uh being um. I suppose uh, a woman, particularly in financial services, and yeah. I suppose thinking about having to, I don't think it is seen as a step back anymore, but I think sometimes we need to reframe that in our own minds. Um, and I do think um, kind of, you know, taking the time to pri kind of prioritize your family, prioritize that aspect of your life sometimes can be a little bit difficult. Um, but those for me, I think are probably the key challenges I see. And then, as I said, having those having those women that you can uh you can kind of see ahead of you um and that are kind of forging the way I think is 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 really key and having those role models yeah. um no. you know that, that... No, I think um role models and mentors are massively important things in people's lives Claire, Claire do you have your hand up there for a question I just see your hand up there or maybe just a random hand is in the air <laughs> we'll go with the random hand um, and just on men, uh, yeah, cliches are cliches for a reason, Gillian, and it's true. Yeah. Men do shout louder. So, S Susan, um, and you might actually, Susan, I might take the opportunity because yeah. I know you actually had uh, the misfortune to interview me recently. Um, you might talk about even your own research because I think it fits. Yeah, I was just going to say that point. because I suppose going back for me, it's going back much further. Now, it's very interesting, mm -hmm. Michelle, saying there 10 years she's seen a huge difference. Well, it was a completely different animal back in the 90s and the 80s, you know, it was very, very different in Dublin and London. So that's where I came from. Very male dominated environment. It was it, it's insurance. I'm, it, it has improved. I, I don't think it's there yet. Uh, po a lot of positive developments since then I can see in women's progress, which both of you said as well. Um, uh, and um you know, there are challenges. We can still see that. So all the studies that are coming out, the Central Bank of Ireland report, CBI report, Balance for Better Business report, all the other big audit firms reports, they all have a common thread, I think. They're showing good progress on boards, uh, but in senior executive roles and particular certain roles, uh, it's different. So I'd say, what are the challenges I've had um, over the years? Um, I only I started my family when I came back to Ireland, so I, I think that that brings a whole area. Uh, if you have if, if you have par parental responsibilities, um, uh, and uh, I, I didn't uh, my success obviously in London where where I left there at a really good experience, then came back to Dublin and I was with the same family office. They were probably a bit more progressive, I would say, than your average company. I can see that now. They they actually had work work life balance before it existed, as in you could do some remote working. So that is incredible. Uh, and the CEO could be at home as much as I could if a, a child was sick. So uh, sometimes I think culture is hugely important. Yeah. But um, so uh, so I would say that I, I had a very supportive husband. Uh, so I, I did continue working. I did take, obviously, per, uh, per, some parental leave and some, um, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I had my children, I, I would have taken maternity leave. Uh, but I didn't have a big gap in my career and that can make a big difference too. So what I'm seeing from um, uh, is the, the male, do you know what? When I went over to London, I was expecting it to be male dominated, which is interesting. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because you expect it and I worked with it and I worked and I just worked very hard. The Japanese were fascinated with me. They thought I was amazing because I had such a driven work. I had such a work ethic. They were fascinated, you know. Uh, but I wasn't on my Nintendo, mind you. I was actually working. So <laughs> to say what it was like in Tokyo. But um, so so I I had very positive experiences, and I think I'm I'm fortunate. But what what had what have I seen over the years myself, uh, and through some of the preliminary findings in in the research I'm looking at, is that women are not always putting themselves forward. They have they lack confidence in progressing. They have to be almost too perfect. 
You know, that that wow. is a problem, I think, with some women, not all. Another factor, of course, is the, the parental responsibilities. And I think that's huge. I yeah. really think that's yeah. huge. And we're seeing, you know, when you're in the middle management stage, um, uh, if companies are not flexible and if they don't take into account, uh, work, you know, uh, work life balance for both men and women, it, it benefits both. Um, they're losing talent in a big yeah. way. Yeah. And like there is a talent shortage and they need to be aware of that, you know, so I think how you approach women in that middle management space is hugely important. So when they're you're coming with your children saying I, I need some flexibility that they're that they do kind of embrace that more uh, and approach them differently. So women, I think are, we're, what we're seeing is they're not putting themselves forward for certain roles um, and they're also going for industries and roles that have better uh, control over your work-life balance so some of the roles we'll say that are revenue generating like the CFO like I was a CFO in industry but CFO the percentage of female CFOs is quite low considering there are a huge amount of women in finance and doing accountancy so that that's an interesting one CEO COO those kind of revenue generating roles um, perhaps it's the work-life balance uh, aspect of it um, uh, the other one that I think sorry is interesting was uh, how women are integrated back into the workspace, you know, if they're off on, on maternity. And again, that's the middle management space. I think uh, how companies approach that uh, in terms of integrating them back. So there's nothing illegal happening, like they're getting mm -hmm. similar roles, but they could be sidelined or whatever. So I'm seeing that, um, uh, seeing that as barriers to female participation uh, is it, 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 a lot of it is culture driven. I think that, that, that's that, that's that's such a massive word. Just just um to, yeah. to sort of reinforce something that Susan said because we discussed it when Susan did actually she's interviewing various people for her research that that post maternity integration back into the workforce is a, a something I hear a lot about in my own conversations and I have to say not not in a good way not in a good way and that I to me is still quite a serious challenge. I think with post maternity kind of reintroduction, you've already gone under a very significant change as 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 a person. You know, you've significantly adjusted. You've become somebody. You know, somebody's mother. You're. You know, and this isn't this isn't just exclusively about women who are mothers, but you know, you do undergo a, a very significant personal change. And then I know myself, the imposter syndrome was real. I really struggled when I went back into the workforce about would I be good enough did I you know did I take too much time away will I get back up to speak can I juggle all this stuff um and to Jillian's point it was it was me it was me who was my own worst critic or my own worst enemy because I didn't have the belief in myself so I do understand the sentiment about reintegrating after maternity or any type of leave any type of lengthy leave be it sick leave or otherwise yeah. um, you know where a career break it, it can be very hard for a woman to kind of adjust her confidence to kind of get back in there and, and pick back up where she left off yeah I, I just think you got just going to follow through on the culture and start back with Susan go back across um, the three three of you um I do think that's obviously again, one of the elements to the, the barriers for, for women to reach senior leadership positions. And obviously, as you say, you know, being, being a working mother and all of that, you know, as Susan said, maybe uh, women take other choices. Um, so despite the fact we have seen some improvements, Susan alluded to some of the recent statistics. Mm. I, I just want to go back to that word culture, Susan, that, you know, in terms of improving the culture, I've become a great believer that it has to come from the top. Mm. It, it's a leadership thing. Yeah. Leaders create culture in companies. Yeah. So just picking up on that point, um, maybe there have been some improvements. Maybe I could say from, even in the fintech world, Michelle, we see more female leadership. It's really positive. But what, what are the challenges that are still there? And what, if anything, could we be doing to help more women into those leadership positions to improve the overall culture? Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, I think central bank are doing phenomenal work, actually. And I think it's important that the government is behind any initiatives that balance for better business initiative is target driven. So they're encouraging companies to get on board. And that really requires a change in culture. Yeah. And it's more than just saying that you, yes, we have a culture. It, it needs to be embedded right throughout the organization. And some of them are just not an easy fix. 
yeah. you know like uh, i think the sectors and roles within the financial services that are most male dominated they're basically a harder nut to to crack but i do also see that there is a will to to improve the diversity there but if they're not getting applicants in the first place in some roles do you get me yeah. it, it's a problem and i think um I mean, culture is king, uh, as you say, or we'll say queen in the, as the day that's in it. Um, but um, the tone is set at the top. I totally agree with that. Uh, and if uh, cultural values and uh, d diversity inclusion needs to be embedded right throughout the organization. Um, I do think, though, you know, there, with opportunities, it's more than giving opportunities to people. It's, 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 it's facilitating that they can take up those opportunities. <laughs> Uh, and that's 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 a bigger a bigger challenge. You know what I mean? You can say, oh, I'm giving, and and I got this throughout uh, it, in the studies I've been doing, looking at the research I'm doing. The opportunities in Ireland seem to be seem to exist. Uh, the opportunities might exist, but how do you facilitate people applying? You know where there's barriers in place to them doing that. Uh, and I think um, so. Uh, I think, uh, the, the, uh, and to be honest, the, the, the results we talked about, the results that you you shared um, with us, uh, Jackie shared with us, um, they're positive in some respects. You know, we're seeing improvements. Um, but the, the, so the traje trajectory is good, uh, certainly on boards, but in the senior positions in yeah. certain sectors, and actually in your spin space. From uh, see, a central bank said, from our analysis, we've seen that female representation remains strong in applications for second line of defence roles, such as head of compliance, uh, of compliance and head of anti money laundering. So that's very positive. Uh, that but... is, and um, I, I must say, you know, um, over the past three years, uh, graduates and learners, and you know, Jackie might, if you want to comment on this, Jackie, I, I would say, and Michelle's witnessed it firsthand, and you have to some degree, Susan. I'd say at least two thirds of our learners are female. At least two thirds. Yeah. Um, and 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 hopefully, and again, I want to come back to what Susan touched on, Gillian. Um, it is about creating opportunities, but just slightly changing the subject. But I think it's very, very much to the heart of what we're trying to get to. Is it's how do you manage talent? So I say this in the context that we like to think that we're trying to create talented individuals to work in the industry. Um, but, but I'm always very interested in how do we manage talent. It's like a life cycle of talent. How do you create opportunities? How do you maintain opportunities? How do you create a culture? Back to that word again, Susan, to support that type of um, you know talent management. So again, I don't know if that resonates with you, Gillian, or you know any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I do think it's it, it's really important. I do think. Um, you know, I think in terms of the talent management piece, I think again, um, going back to myself, I think sometimes, you know, if, if you can maybe spot somebody who's working with you or for you or whatever that may be, who is super talented um, and you kind of, I, I suppose you try and um, maybe uh, rightly or wrongly correct your own mistakes, Andrew, in terms of, you know, bringing them on, uh, bringing them on that journey or maybe right. trying to, you um, you know, accelerate that journey for them to have that confidence in themselves to have to kind of, you know, be able to, you know, um, uh, I suppose, shout loudly about all the good uh, about all the good things that they're doing. Um, I do really think it helps. Um, as you said, like, uh, you can't underestimate the value of like a mentor or a champion. No. Um, I do think, um, be that a man or a woman, um, yeah. but I, I do think like you can't un underestimate that. And for me, that talent management piece is really trying to be that for somebody else yes. and, and really create that opportunity for somebody else yep. to bring them through the organization for them to see the benefit of, you know, staying within the organization, what the organization can offer them. Um, and yeah, I think the talent management piece is key. I think uh, particularly around the mid middle management, um, I think, you know, I think you do see kind of sometimes women kind of at, at that middle management stage, um, you know, take time out to have kids or maybe build their family or do something else um, and then try to come back into the environment um, and, you know, really try to push them on to the next level. I do think we have to have the appropriate supports uh, to be able to facilitate that. Um, and, and I really think now, I think COVID helped a lot in terms of remote working and flexibility and uh, being able to say, I'm at home today because my child is sick or whatever, 
whatever else uh, you might you might have going on in your life. So I do think that helped an awful lot. I do, oh. to Michelle's point earlier, look back and at some of the women I worked with who turned up to the office in, you know, four inch stilettos <laughs> five <laughs> days a week with three kids at home. Now that I have kids myself and I probably completely underestimated it <laughs> at the time. So, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, when you think back at it, some of it was incredible. But um, yeah, I think for me, the 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 talent management piece is really about spotting those individuals that you kind of want to bring bring on that journey with you, and I suppose being that champion and being that mentor for them. It, it, it's it's a nice coincidence because um, when when I when I use or think of the word confidence, for some reason Jackie Ryan always pops into my head because um, <laughs> Jackie used that word at a face to face event we actually had in Tala, to you Tala, um, nearly two years ago, no, about a year and a half ago now. And I actually think that a lot of what we try to do, and I was only talking to Jackie, now she's part of the team here yesterday about this, is, and Michelle would have experienced this, and Susan, I'm sure you have as well, that a lot of our learners, when they come to you and they want to speak to you like a, about the course or whatever it happens to be, a lot of the time it is about them looking for somebody to believe in them and to give them the confidence. And it was interesting that you said that about women in general in your research as well, Susan, that this this is the confidence that, that somehow you have to be perfect, as Michelle alluded to as well. It sort of interrelates into that idea around confidence. So just on to you, Michelle. I'm going to say something a little bit provocative, which is not like me at all. Um, I, 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 actually, I, I actually strongly believe this, and anyone who knows me would have heard me say this, so it, it's, not, it's not a newsflash. I do think in Ireland, uh, particularly in the more traditional financial services providers, there is still a lot of quite old school male attitudes, in my opinion. And I do think as well, men have a tendency to resist change. You know, the expression about uh, protecting your own moats. They don't, they like to keep people away from their power, if you like. So going back to how we can think about changing that culture, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts or do you see what you see in the fintech world as maybe being something I'd like to think of a model of how we can look to change the nature of financial services. Yeah, I I think with the fintech world, I think we need to look at it that it's a new it's a new world. Um, exactly. You know, it's starting with a, a kind of blank page, whereas financial services more broadly is the oldest industry in the world. So it, it's going to take time to turn that big ship, and it's as simple as that. Um, with fintech. They're a bit more agile, they're a bit more trendy, dare I say it, um, and they could start from scratch. They could build the culture that they wanted. And frankly, culture is really, really important in the startup space because you, you have to push your sleeves up and kind of get dirty and do do lots yeah. of you know yeah. hard work to get this thing off the ground. So everybody has to get on or at least culturally align and work together. And I think that's where fintechs and startups have been quite successful in this space. And this is why we're seeing more women. Certainly I have seen the benefit of it. You know, it's, I can log off at five o'clock to pick up my son, but I'll log back on at nine o'clock or eight o'clock when he goes to bed, because do you know what I want? They give me flexibility. I want to give that back. Yeah. And I worked on the traditional side. <clears throat> it was very much bums on seat mentality and, you know, like we need you need to be here you need to meet your contract hours and I I understand the protectionist nature of things and sometimes it's very hard for people who where it's so ingrained that you know we always wear bums on seats you have to come back in we need you back in five days a week we need to supervise you while watching you we haven't been creative enough to find ways to supervise you remotely or maybe we haven't invested time in supervising remotely or do you know what we just don't trust you at, at all so tough <laughs> to go back to the office and you hear various modicums of this around the city at, at right now you know we, like there's certain companies that are in war with staff trying to bring them back for I, I, I was going to come on to that um and actually I might just lead on to the next question on that Michelle because um first of all you know when you when you talk there about legacy and when I talk about the diff, people ask me, what's the difference between a sort of fintech and an incumbent? Well, okay, I, I, I often struggle with that question because you're all providing financial services. But the key difference is the legacy issue, in my opinion. Fintechs are digitally native, so they don't have that legacy of ICT or whatever. 
you know, still using COBOL, you know, in programming type thing. But I, I often also talk about the cultural legacy. I think yeah. don't have that cultural legacy that a lot yeah. of traditional financial providers have. And that does take time to change. So talking about change, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what the three of you think, particularly from a female perspective. Are we in danger of regressing back to a pre-COVID type work environment where we're going to lose some of the benefits that COVID created? And I say this particularly from the perspective of PAT Business School, we're actually quite proud of the fact that we're totally remote. Like, you know, my, my team, my six people that I work with day in, day out, we all work from different parts of the country. And, you know, one of the downsides, we don't see each other that often, but we've created a very, I think, healthy work environment in a, in a, remote, um, in a remote work setting. So start with you, Michelle. Are we, that? because I hear a lot of this, and I won't quote anyone specifically, but the resistance to return back to the office and people literally leaving roles because they don't want to be dragged back into the office. And that probably impacts women more than men, I suspect. Yeah, I, I guess full disclosure, my company's in Cork and I'm, I'm okay. sitting comfortably here in Dundalk. So I'm about three and a half hours away from our, our head office. So I am fully remote. Uh, we're a remote first company um, and we work on the premise that as long as the work gets done, we're happy yeah. um but we we have the luxury of doing that you know we have a, a kind of small building space um we can't fit everybody in when we take everybody down to cork for a day um you know so we've operated on that principle from the start but that's the expectation of that sector like frankly you know that anybody who works in digitally native sectors have the expectation of remote flexibility I think in other sectors, and actually, ironically, I'm hearing it about a tech company that they are trying to take their staff back five days a week. And I'm not sure the motivation for that for, for a tech firm, but I do know in finance, um, I have friends who still who are in very senior positions and now they're looking three days back. Initially it was one day, then it was two day. And I have friends who've bought homes in different parts of the country because of the cost of living crisis. I've got friends who can have their children in creches beside their homes and not have to lift them at 6 a.m. to, you know, drag them to train stations or look for alternate minders. So the flexibility works. Yeah. And yeah. I think they're rewarded with happier and more productive staff. And I say that as a senior leader, I would much prefer a clear open line of communication from an employee that says I'm having this problem I'll get whatever I need doing done but I need a bit of bandwidth here yeah. Yeah. I respect honesty and transparency in that place and that's where trust is earned and gained I not you know if I start saying to people no you can't do that or no you have to come to Cork every day, every day of the week while I sit in Dundalk that, that's going to be a problem for people and you're going to have unhappy staff and then morale impacts culture, and then culture days at the firm's impacted. It's, it's a negative or, loop, right? It's just a negative loop. Yeah. yeah. Or look, we can't dismiss the fact that in some cases, and not all, there can be a, a bad apple in a barrel. And sometimes that does upset the apple cart for everybody else. Um, and uh, forgive the puns, but there, there are scenarios, and I'm sure they exist the larger the organization you are, the bigger chance you are of seeing those things because it's t yeah. harder to control culture or manage culture. So yes, I think we are at risk, but I think it's about transparency and open communication between leadership and employees about needs, wants, and business strategy. And I think that's really, really important. I, 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 again, I think the segue for me is back to talent management and it's about culture and it's about adapting to change as michelle has just just demonstrated and i'd like to think we're very similar the way we operate michelle have a very similar approach so just on that Gillian, um in your world how does it look in terms of people being literally dragged back into the office yeah and, yeah <laughs> um i suppose maybe in our world it's less straightforward i would say because obviously we're a client-led business or True, um yeah. You know, if you want to be crude about it, you can call us a revenue-led business. Or <laughs> no, however, I think that's true, Gideon. I think that's true. <laughs> you know, however you want to frame it. But <laughs> uh, I think 
I think personally at the moment I feel like I've got good balance now I am very fortunate uh I was one of those mad people that before COVID bought a house uh very close to my office because I had to be there five days a week uh which during COVID we did kind of look back on and think that was a bit mad uh but I think it's um I think uh we are probably seeing very varying levels of this in terms of the middle management and definitely the more senior team want flexibility. Actually, our more junior resources would probably like to, or people starting out in their career, people going through training programs, things like that, kind of like the camaraderie of being in the office, maybe their commitments outside work, not the same for everybody, but you know, um, they have a little bit more flexibility. So kind of like that kind of in-office environment uh, gives them a chance to go to the pub after work or do something together after work if they want. Um, which again speaks to good culture and good morale on the team when people kind of have that um you know outside of work relationship or you know that kind of um I don't know you know that post work kind of bonding oh. I, I do think absolutely helps so I think at the moment I would think we're getting it right in terms of balance we have no mandated we're very lucky we have okay. no mandated days in the office okay. so um we're hoping it stays that way but you know we 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 kind of have a policy that you make it work for you um now we do try and obviously bring the team together to michelle's point if you can get everyone around the table it is nice to see people in person but i do think um i do think we are seeing a little bit more though of in-person things creep back in i have lots of clients now who want to meet in person um and it's just something we can't we are we're just trying to manage yeah, with yeah. staff and and with clients but trying not to be too um too rigid in our approach to that yeah, I would exactly say. I, I think a, w- a word that i would often use is pragmatism like let's just yeah. be pragmatic about this you know yeah. let's just think about what's the best way to optimize you know people's workflows or yeah. the culture in the office or whatever it happens to be yeah. I, I just i suppose i'm going to move back to susan and then we'll finish up with a with, with, with the final question I, I don't know if you want me to leave time for questions has anyone got any questions but looping back to susan um you know, I think this all does relate to the challenges, maybe. It's an area where, let's say, women are more challenged in the sense that I think the more flexibility and pragmatism about the workplace, mm-hmm. the more likelihood it is that women will reach those senior positions and will be in place to change the culture in the way we're talking about. So mm-hmm. this is quite an important issue, I think. So I don't know, Susan, just general thoughts. Um, yeah, well, look, just on that was really interesting what the what uh, both Gillian and Michelle were saying there, and I'd love to know if there's a gender aspect to it. If you're seeing more women take up the remote working than men do, or is it both? And I think um, that would be interesting to know. But the other thing is there is a work life balance and miscellaneous provisions act 2023. Wow. That. It's a right of workers to request remote working. That's into operation now, but it's to request remote working, uh, which is very different to grant. Yeah. Uh, like to request flexible working arrangements for parents and carers so i don't know how that that only came into operation in 2023 so i don't know what impact that would have had if any uh michelle or it's, Gillian, an, it's, an inter- it's an interesting area actually um susan to what degree because you mentioned earlier about the government or regulatory authorities have to support the type of change that we're trying to uh, promote here to what degree do you think that could be effective like legislation in this area well, actually, the WRC have just issued their framework. I think it was late last night they issued it. Um, I I think some organisations have this in practice already, Susan. To answer your question about gender balance, it's fairly equal. Um, I I work with some uh, wonderful fathers and I tend to see them going and doing school runs and, you know, doing drop offs and things like that. So culturally, you know, it's it's very much 50 50. Um, but I think, I don't know if legislation, particularly for larger organizations, if it, it makes it a bit more problematic because there's more admin with it, yeah. uh, to be honest, because a, a quick scan of the code of practice has very kind of arbitrary timelines and and forms and things like that that have to be adhered to. So smaller organ- organizations can be more pragmatic. It's harder for larger organizations. So Jill, I think with, Deloitte I think obviously that's an an engine room of of an organization so (laughs) 
I could imagine having to balance all that has to be a lot more complicated than we have it at I'd, the holiday. I'd, I'd, I'd often use an expression, the tyranny of HR, you know, <laughs> um, you know, it just becomes such a burden. But listen, um, I don't know if anyone in the audience wanted to jump in with a question at this point, because I'm conscious we're down to the last 10 minutes. Or an observation. Okay, we'll roll with that. So look, look um, given the day that's in it as well, um, I just thought maybe the final question, I'll start with Susan, we'll keep the same process. Um, this is all part of obviously for me, um, a, a bigger challenge or something that I think um, we're all very aligned to is greater diversity in, in everything, including the workplace. And you know, again, this is something we very much promote um, in, in our classes. With, I think, as Michelle can attest to, we're very diverse classes, like culturally, ethnicity, experience, background, you know, you name it, really. But I'm just going to premise the question by saying I personally believe that the more diversity we have, the, the better the culture and decision making becomes because you get different opinions, different perspectives. And we see this in our learners, and I think it's a truism of, of, the, of the workplace. So I suppose the question is, we, we'll probably feel like we've made progress, Susan, but you know, obviously there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of promoting diversity in the workplace. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And look, at you're absolutely right. Uh, diversity is, is it's socioeconomic. I see it in my classroom, ethnicity, yeah. lots of different backgrounds, which is hugely beneficial. And, and there's a whole body of research out there now that's showing that, you know, diverse uh, teams uh, can bring an extra dimension. And of course, your your customers are diverse. So you're reflecting, yeah. uh, reflecting society. And I suppose the big thing is, is and we haven't mentioned it really, is sustainability. Like sustainability is huge. You know, you have ESG, yeah. uh, um, the environment, society, social and governance. And that's and something TU Dublin are hugely uh, passionate. Yes. yes. I think you know that's that's what it's all about, really. Like a diverse, you're 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 actually looking at the future of uh, of of improving society as well as improving financial performance. The triple bottom line, as they said, yep. you're the the environment as well. And I think if you get the governance right, uh, and that is culture, as you said, you yeah. know, king culture embedded right throughout the organisation. Uh, that's what will drive the change, and I think that I think that the in the financial services they're very clued in to the fact that uh, that there's a good business case for diversity. They know that, you know. So I think as as I was saying earlier, um, the opportunities I also think are there. It's taking away the barriers in different, yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, I think that's what's hugely important. I, I, I like the way you put that because that's the way I would reframe it, Julian. Because I think. Too often we don't frame these things the correct way. I think there is a compelling value proposition around increasing diversity for any business. So yeah. I, I don't know your views on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, even from a regulatory perspective, we, we like we have seen the, I think we'll all say, in, you know, uh, when we saw... The, you know the financial crisis of you know 2008 2009 the group think that went on and in, in, exactly. in those rooms um you know probably, probably, uh, probably white males as well as truth be told Gillian well, I didn't want to go that far out no, 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 I'll do, I'll do you. <laughs> um so you know I think like I think the dangers of that have been very much um have been called out and I think from a regulatory perspective um I definitely think financial services firms are aware of that kind of need for diversity of thought um, having people from different backgrounds uh, with different skill sets, experiences that, 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 you know, that making those key decisions. And I definitely think for our clients, it's definitely seeing something, it's something we're seeing that's, you know, at the fore of, uh, of that kind of um, C-suite top layer. Um, and uh, to Susan's point, that does then drive the culture yeah. kind of throughout, throughout the yeah. firm. Totally. And Michelle, any final thoughts on that? Yeah, I think both ladies have said, you know, diversity improves decision making. Um, and I, you know, I think that can only benefit any organization. Um, you know, even this open door trans, you know, air of transparency, you know, people are free to to think or speak up with their opinions and free to be who they are and want to be. I think it's very, very important um in any organization because 
I think if people feel heard and respected and their opinions are valued, I think there's better outcomes for organisations entirely. I totally agree. And that actually reminds me, I read something earlier, another, another big word is um, being authentic. But you have to give people the confidence to be themselves. And that leads, I think, to greater diversity. And again, I think ultimately that might create better culture. You know, I think the thing they're all into into interwoven, in my opinion. Jackie, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words as the host of this event. It Just say a few. Um, I Perfect. don't know if there are any final questions. Okay, I see nothing coming in at the floor. So I just have a little one minute, I suppose, concluding statement. So first <laughs> of all, thank everybody for coming today. We've really enjoyed hosting the event. If you do nothing, nothing will change. Yeah. Conversations like today need to happen. These conversations we bring back to our workplace, okay? And the one thing I wanted to say is if I took one thing from today, it's to find somebody on my team that needs it and give them the confidence, give them the feedback and the and be an ally. We cannot inspire somebody without allyship. So the one thing to take away is be an ally and help instill confidence on your teammates. Um just that is kind of what I took from today, and I hope everybody else kind of got somewhere in theirs. And um, if we help to, 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 yeah. the word you made me think of there, which has come up a few times, and maybe it's a really nice way to finish up. And maybe this is one of the cliche differences between men and women uh, empathy. You know, we, me and Jackie were only talking about this last night in terms of certain learners, and Jackie had a few calls yesterday. Be empathetic to people. You know, that's a great place to start, I think, in all of this. And and making, as Jackie said, this more than a conversation, but something we actually start to um to to you know to live on, I suppose. And I think to a great degree everyone on this call is already living that, but it's something to be encouraged. So listen, um that that's me, Jackie. Uh, if you want to wrap it up, um tiny bit early, but all good, I think. That's okay. Well, look, thank you all for attending. This is our first webinar. Our next one should take place around the, the 12th of April. I think it's a Friday and it's on personal data resilience. They're going and to be called the bite-sized chunk. That one. <laughs> <laughs> They're called the bite-sized chunk. They're going to be 30 minutes in less and we'll have one a month. So keep your eye on the space. And thank sure. you so much for coming. Uh, thanks everyone, especially the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And thank thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. Everyone. See you. Take care. Bye-bye.